Pressing techniques. Good pressing is as essential as good construction. Pressing equipment used correctly aids in achieving a professional appearance. The first step in pressing darts is to press the dart along the fold line. Notice that most pressing is done from the wrong side of the fabric. The pressing cushion can be used when pressing darts flat. Place the dart wrong side up over the pressing cushion. Notice that the cushion is curved to resemble curves on the body. Press horizontal darts down and vertical darts towards the center. The pressing cushion can be used to press curved seams, such as the side seam on a skirt. Position the seam on the cushion. Finger press the seam before pressing with the iron. Notice that an up and down motion is used rather than a sliding motion. When pressing heavier materials or fabric that press marks easily, place paper under the seam edges to prevent an imprint on the right side of the garment. The seam roll is a helpful tool when pressing open straight seams, especially seams on sleeves and pants. Place the seam over the seam roll. Again, finger press ahead of the iron. Paper is usually not needed under the seam edges when a seam roll is used. The rounded surface of the seam roll limits contact with the iron to just the stitching line. A point presser is useful for pressing seams open on collars, cuffs, and waistbands. These seams are difficult to reach using a seam roll. Finger press the seam open first, then press with the tip of the iron. A needle board is a useful tool for pressing napped and pile fabrics. The nap or pile side of the fabric is placed against the wire side of the needle board to prevent the fabric surface from becoming distorted while pressing. Place strips of heavy paper under the fold of a dart or seam edges to help prevent press marks from showing on the right side. This is a dart that has been slashed and is being pressed open to reduce bulk. You may find it helpful to place the needle board over a pressing cushion when pressing dart points or curved seams. Stay stitching and directional stitching. Before deciding upon the direction for stitching, it is necessary to first determine the direction of grain. Grain refers to the direction of yarns in a fabric. Slide thumb and forefinger along a cut edge to determine grain direction. The direction identified here is with the grain. The direction identified here is against the grain. Notice the yarns are forced apart when sliding your hand along the cut edge. Stay stitching is a line of regular machine stitching in the seam allowance, 1 16th to 1 8th inch from the seam line. Stay stitch with the grain of the fabric. It is usually not necessary to back stitch or tie threads when stay stitching. Stay stitching is usually done through a single layer and should be within the seam allowance so that it will not show once the garment is completed. Neck edges are the ones most often stay stitched. Shoulder seams may be stay stitched on very stretchy fabrics. Remember to stitch with the grain of the fabric when stay stitching. If a garment is interfaced or underlined, the stay stitching may be done through both layers of fabric as in the case of this front opening, which has already been interfaced. On this portion of the neckline seam, the stay stitching is done through both the interfacing and the fashion fabric. These two layers are treated as one when finishing the neck edge. Seam edges, which will be basted or stitched together before fitting, do not need to be stay stitched.
Directional stitching refers to the direction of stitching seams in a garment. Seams which do not follow straight grain are usually stitched with the grain. Another way to remember this is to stitch from wide to narrow or from the highest point to the lowest point. On this side seam, stitch from the widest area to the narrowest area. On a skirt, this is from the bottom to the top. When stitching a shoulder seam, stitch from the neck edge to the armhole or from the highest point to the lowest point. This is another way of identifying which direction is with the grain of the fabric. Remember that most cutting, stitching, and pressing is done with the grain of the fabric so that yarns are not forced apart along a cut edge. Making darts, tucks, and pleats. A dart is a fold of fabric stitched a specific width at the top and tapered to a point at one or both ends. Dart markings are usually transferred to the fabric with a tracing wheel, tailor's tacks, or pins. Fold the dart along the fold line and pin. If you place your pins parallel to and directly on the stitching line, you can check the location for stitching on both sides of the fabric. Darts are usually stitched from the wide end to the points. Secure thread ends by backstitching at the wide end. To prevent bubbling at the point, the dart should be tapered gradually to the point, with the last two or three stitches being right along the fold. Backstitching at the point can create too much bulk so secure the threads by tying a knot. To make a tailor's knot, form a loop with both threads. Bring the ends through the loop, place your finger over the knot, and pull the threads tight. Notice how the stitching line tapers gradually to a point. Check to see that matching darts are identical in length and width. Completed darts should be nice and straight, with no bubbling at the point. A tuck is a fold of fabric secured at a seam or held in place by stitching. To form the tuck, fold the fabric right sides together, matching the pattern markings. Pin along the marked line, checking the placement of the pin on both sides of the fabric. All of the tucks in one section can be pinned before stitching. Tucks vary in size depending on the design of the garment and the look intended. From the wrong side, stitch the tuck as indicated on the pattern. With the needle in the fabric, pivot, then stitch to the fold. Since all stitching is on the wrong side, threads can be secured by backstitching. Be sure that all matching tucks are the same length. Tucks may be stitched for only a short distance as illustrated here, or the stitching may extend the full length of the garment piece. For decorative tucks, reverse the process and stitch the tuck on the outside. Press the tucks, turning them in the direction indicated on the pattern. Secure the tuck at the top by stitching across it near the seam line. This stitching helps to keep the ends of the tucks in place during the rest of the garment construction. Tucks may be decorative or used to provide relaxed but defined fullness. The fabric below the stitched area is usually not creased when the garment is pressed. Pin tucks are very narrow folds, usually stitched on the outside of the garment. The fold line is usually marked with a basting, since it must be folded with wrong sides together, or the right side of the fabric facing you. Machine stitch close to this folded edge, making sure that all tucks are the same length. 
you will want to be sure that the stitching line is an even distance from the edge. If the bottom of the tuck ends in the middle of the garment piece, thread should be pulled to the wrong side and tied. Use a pin to pull threads to the wrong side. To make a tailor's knot, form a loop with both threads. Bring the ends through the loop, place your finger over the knot, and pull the threads tight. When there are many tucks close together, it is important that they are parallel to each other and even in length. Pleat markings must be transferred from the pattern to the fabric. This can be first done with a tracing wheel, then with hand basting. Notice the arrows on the pattern indicating the direction for folding the pleats. Form the pleat by matching the appropriate markings, making sure you are folding it in the direction indicated on the pattern. Pin in place the full length of each pleat. If necessary, the pleat can also be hand basted before doing any machine stitching. Pleats are often top stitched for a short distance close to the folded edge. This stitching may be substituted with machine stitching on the wrong side along the fold line. Be sure that the stitching for all pleats is the same length. The fabric below a stitched pleat may be pressed flat forming sharp folds as compared to softer fullness created by tucks. Making gathers. Gathers are used to control or to distribute fullness in certain areas in a garment. Two or three rows of stitching are used to gather up the material. The first row of stitching is placed close to the seam line, or about 5 8 inch from the cut edge. For lightweight fabrics, a setting of about 10 stitches per inch would be the right length. Make two additional rows of stitching, one on each side of the first and about 1 8 to 1 4 inch away. Grasp the three threads all at one time and draw up the fullness. Usually the bobbin threads are easier to pull. Pull up the approximate amount to be gathered. Pin the gathered edge to the straight edge, matching the notches and other necessary markings. To anchor the threads at the ends of the gathers, simply wind them around a pin. This way you can gather right up to the pin without losing the fullness. Distribute the gathers evenly. Then pin the two layers together at regular intervals. Always keep the raw edges even when pinning the two layers together. Notice how much easier it is to adjust the fullness and control the fabric when three rows of stitching are used. If you are gathering at long distance, it may be easier to start pulling threads at several places rather than using one continuous row of gathering thread. Stitch the seam using a regular length stitch with the gathered side up. When you come to the pin holding the gathering threads, remove the pin and release the threads before sewing over that area. Stitch over the gathers slowly and adjust any of the fullness when necessary. This stitching should be located just below the middle row of the gathering stitching. Make a second row of permanent stitching one fourth inch into the seam allowance from the seam line. This second row really helps to flatten the bulk created by the gathers. Remove any of the gathering threads that show on the right side or you may remove all of the gathering threads if you prefer. Then trim the seam allowance of the gathered edge only, close to the second line of stitching. This removes all of the bulk created by the gathers, so you end up with a smooth, flat seam.
The finished gathers should be evenly spaced and should not have any large tucks in the gathered area. When pressing the seam, press on the ungathered side using the tip of the iron, pressing only to the seam line. Finishing Garment Edges Edge finishes are used to prevent raveling. Firmly woven fabrics that do not ravel and knitted materials may require no finishing. Edge stitching is a row of straight machine stitching placed about 1 4th inch from the raw edge. A regular stitch length of 12 to 15 stitches per inch would be used. Edge stitching should be used on fabrics that ravel only slightly, such as wool or on some knits to prevent edges from curling. When turning an edge stitching a curved edge, first machine stitch 1 4th inch from the raw edge. If you are going to turn an edge stitch a straight edge, then this first step can be omitted. Use this first stitching line as a guide for folding under 1 4th inch. It may help to finger press along the edge before machine stitching. Place the second row of stitching about 1 16th from the folded edge to give a nice flat finish. This finish is used on light to medium weight fabrics. It should not be used if it creates an undesirable bulky edge. The zigzag edge finish should be placed on the very edge of a seam, or it may be placed a slight distance from the edge if the seam allowance is later trimmed close to the zigzag stitching. To prevent a corded or rolled edge when zigzagging, the upper and lower thread tensions may need to be loosened. Or you may use a three-step or multiple zigzag in place of the one-step zigzag. When both seam edges are turned in the same direction, as on the armhole of a set-in sleeve, the edges may be zigzagged together. Another place when this might occur would be a waistline seam where both seam allowances are turned toward the bodice. The zigzag or multiple zigzag stitch would be used on medium to heavy weight materials. To be most effective, it should be on the very edge of the material. Handover casting is done by taking small, even stitches over a raw edge. Stitches are usually about 1 4th inch apart and 1 4th inch in depth. Threads should not be pulled so tight so as to cause the fabric edge to curl. using hand stitches. The blind or slip stitch can be used as a hemming stitch and to secure waistbands, collars, and cuffs. If the slip stitch is used as a hem, as in this example, the stitch should be slightly loose and stitches are usually about one-half to three-fourths inch apart. When hand stitching cuffs, collars, or waistbands, Stitches are pulled tight and can be closer together. To make a blind or slip stitch, first fasten thread securely under the edge. Take a very small stitch in the garment fabric directly below the stitch in the upper edge. Slide the needle through the fold of the upper fabric. Notice very little thread is exposed. The cat stitch is worked left to right for right-handed persons with the needle always pointing to the left. Take each stitch one half to three fourths inch to the right of the previous stitch, alternating stitches between the two layers of fabric. The cat stitch can be used to attach the inner edge of the interfacing to a fold line, as in this example. If used as a hemming stitch, it is more durable if placed between the hem and the garment, 
rather than over the hem edge. The finished stitch gives a cross stitch appearance. The lock stitch is generally used for hems. It is best used underneath the hem edge. Roll back the hem edge about 1 4th inch. Hold the rolled edge and thread with the thumb. Take a small stitch in both the garment and the rolled edge of the hem. Pull up thread but leave the stitch slightly loose. Space stitches about 1 half inch apart. A tight stitch will cause the hem to show on the right side of the garment. Begin the blanket stitch with the thread on the outside of the fastener. Insert the needle outside the hole and bring it out in the center forming a loop with the thread. Put the needle through the loop and pull tight. Remember the needle is inserted outside the hole and comes up in the middle of the hole. Then go back through the loop and pull tight. Place these stitches close together around each of the holes in the fastener. This stitch is very durable and provides a fastener that is securely attached to the garment. The blanket stitch can also be used as a decorative edge finish and for making thread loops or belt carriers. Layering, trimming, clipping, and notching seam allowances. Enclosed seam allowances should be layered to reduce bulk. Layering seams is cutting seam allowances that lie together to different widths. The seam allowance that is closest to the outside of the finished garment is the widest. In this example, the facing seam allowance will be the narrowest and the garment seam allowance will be left the widest. When there are more than two layers, each layer of fabric would be cut to a different width. The term grading is sometimes used in place of the term layering. Trimming helps to reduce bulk on points and corners on certain parts of a garment. Trim corners by cutting all layers of the seam allowance diagonally to the seam line. These corners are trimmed before turning the garment pieces right side out. Bulk can also be reduced where seams and darts are crossed by another seam by cutting diagonally across the end of the seam allowance. Points or corners of collars, cuffs, and waistbands are trimmed before turning to the right side. The seam allowance in the underarm section of a set and sleeve is often trimmed to 3 8 inch to allow for more comfort. The section trimmed is the area between the notches. When trimming, all layers of the seam allowance are cut the same width, rather than to different widths when layering or grading. The same technique is used on the lower crotch curve of pants and shorts. These edges may need to be finished after trimming to prevent the seam allowance from raveling. Clipping is cutting into the seam allowance with the points of the shears to within a thread of the seam line. Seam allowances of inside curves or concave curves are clipped before that section is turned right side out. Clipping is done after a seam allowance has been layered. Clip as often as needed to permit the seam allowance to spread and lie flat when the garment section is turned right side out. If the fabric is heavy or bulky, each layer of the seam allowance should be clipped separately so that the seam allowance is spread in different places. Notice how each layer is clipped at different places along the seam line so that when the seam allowance opens up, it spreads in different places. This technique is called alternate clipping. Notching is cutting V-shaped wedges out of a seam allowance to reduce bulk. Seam allowances of outside curves, such as those on a round collar, are notched. Notching is done after a seam allowance has been layered. For a smoother outer curve, 
It is better to cut several small notches and place them closer together rather than a few widely spaced notches. Machine stitching techniques. Understitching is done after a seam allowance has been layered. If the seam is curved, it should also be clipped if it is an inside curve or notched if it is an outside curve. The seam allowances are turned toward the under section of the garment. In this case, they are turned towards the facing. Understitching is placed on the facing side of the seam but as close to the seam line as possible. When understitching, hold the fabric taut on each side of the presser foot to avoid having any fabric overlap the seam line. Stitch slowly and carefully, checking to see that the seam allowances are always turned in the right direction. A regular stitch length is used. The seam is then pressed after the understitching is completed. This stitching helps to roll the seam line slightly to the underside of the garment, so the understitching should not show from the right side. It also helps to flatten the bulky seam allowance. Top stitching is done on the right side of the garment, an even distance from an edge or seam. The edge of the presser foot can be used as a guide for even top stitching. When starting on a finished edge, it is better to tie threads rather than back stitch. The longest stitch length is usually used for more decorative top stitching. To make top stitching more obvious, try two strands of sewing thread or a single strand of top stitching thread as the upper thread. It is usually necessary to adjust the machine tension when a heavier thread is used. When the top stitching is further from an edge or seam than the width of the presser foot, Transparent tape or a quilting guide attachment can also be used as a stitching guide. You would want to be sure that the tape did not damage the fabric in any way. Hand basting could also be used as a guide. If the fabric tends to push ahead of the presser foot as you sew, try additional hand basting on each side of the top stitching line to hold the fabric. To really look professional, top stitching must be straight and even. Top stitching can add a decorative touch to a garment, as well as to flatten bulky seam edges. Thread color can match or be contrasting depending on the effect desired. Stitching in the ditch is done in the crevice of a previously stitched seam. If working on a waistband, pin the band to the underside of the garment, extending the edge slightly below the first line of machine stitching. A selvage edge or a folded edge can be used to finish the inside of the waistband. It is important to remember that this edge must be below the first line of machine stitching. From the right side, machine stitch in the crevice or stitch in the ditch of the waistline seam. Hold the fabric taut on each side of the presser foot as you sew. This stitching should just barely catch the free edge on the back side of the garment, and if done with matching thread, should not be noticeable from the right side. Stitching in the ditch can be used along the bottom edge of waistbands and cuffs, or along seams to hold facings or pants cuffs in place. A blind hem is a machine hem that can be used in place of a hand stitched hem. If the fabric ravels, finish the raw edge by zigzagging or turning under about one fourth inch and pressing. Pin or hand base the hem in place. Fold the hem against the right side of the garment with just the edge of the hem extending beyond the fold in the garment. Set the machine for the blind hemming stitch. This stitch consists of four or five straight stitches, then one zigzag stitch that should barely catch the folded edge of the outer fabric.
Position the fabric so that the straight stitching is done along the extended hem edge. The stitch width should be set very narrow so that the zigzag stitch catches only one yarn along the folded edge. On the right side you will probably see the zigzag stitch as this hem will be more obvious than a hand stitched hem.